everybody. I'm Aaron Mesh with Willamette Week, and I'm speaking today with Juan Chavez, who is a lawyer with the Oregon Justice Resource Center. Uh, Juan. Hi. Or, hi. <laughs> I, I kind of figure we should just start with the with the obvious topic, which is tear gas. Uh, like two weeks ago now, maybe a little bit less than that, the mm. Oregon Justice Resource Center filed a federal lawsuit on behalf of Don't Shoot Portland, constraining the P Portland Police Bureau from using tear gas. Um, the federal judge said that uh, the police can use tear gas, but only under very narrow circumstances. And not long after the judge's order, the mayor also said no, no, no on the tear gas. But, you know, it seemed like he was being pressured into it, at least in part, by lawyers. What effect do you think the judge's ruling has had on the police use of, of gas? I think it's made the difference, at least as far as CS gas. And I should be clear that um, the judge described different kinds of weapons that uh, are being used, but it, it the his intention was to just cover uh, CS gas, which is the, 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 the type of chemical that causes the lung inflammation and the coughing in the eyes to uh, water up and spreads out pretty considerably. Uh, there's other kinds uh, of smoke emitting weapons that are used. And I think that's primarily what we've seen since uh, the, the ban was in, in place, uh, which isn't to say that that's still good in a pandemic or necessarily what uh, you know, we wanted to happen. I think it is an opening for the city to reconsider uh, what they've been doing up, up to now. What we've seen in the streets though shows that that has not happened. That reconsideration has not happened. Why is that, do you think? Well, um, accountability. I don't think that the Portland Police Department likes when anybody, you know, from a federal judge to us pissant lawyers on the outside to the lawyers on the inside tell them what to do. Um, they don't like when people are, quote unquote, uh, uh, making policing calls from the dais. So, uh, I, I think that they have um, an authority problem where they don't want to look like they don't have the authority to make these decisions. Um, and they don't like anybody who's challenging that authority. And so they will make a point of it to continue using things that um, assert their authority. So you're spending plenty of time along with dealing with police force looking at the issue of coronavirus in prisons. Yeah. What most troubles you about what you're seeing? I, going back to, to what I said before, accountability. I think that ODOC feels like, ODOC being the Oregon Department of Corrections, I, I get the sense that they now feel like they have carte blanche to, and a blessing from uh, the powers that be to um, not take medical advice about how social distancing should happen in a prison or generally what we need to do in a mass pandemic. And that's a terrifying precedent to set um, for this and any future crisis that comes along. Let's say there's an earthquake, you know, what's ODOC gonna do in that circumstance? Are they still not gonna move people out of their facilities? Some of these buildings are 150 years old. Um, I, I think generally from this whole era of, uh, of a uh, mass uprising, coronavirus, uh, both in prisons and on the outside. My biggest fear is that we're going to make, we're going to, we're going to learn, we're going to think we learned something from this, um, and act in in totally the opposite direction. We're going to, I'm, I fear that we're going to get the wrong lesson out of this era. What's the right lesson? Um, that we need to prioritize people. That we should have been proactive. That the needs of uh, you know, keeping the economy running, quote unquote, or um, upholding mass incarceration should trump uh, good health science or good social science. Um, and you know, it, it, let's, you know, we're looking around at phase one Portland opening up and, and uh, you know, if more and more people get sick and potentially die, 
you know, I, my fear is that we're going to see that as an acceptable outcome. Like, oh, well, we kept the economy going, but, you know, we lost a couple hundred thousand people. You know, that's just the price we pay. That's, that is immoral. I Do you see a, a concerning rise in activity from right-wing groups on the streets of Portland as, um, as, pro as Black Lives Matter protesters are taking to the streets? You know, I think we've seen a lot of rumors of Proud Boys assembling in Portland, ready to attack, you know, uh, uh, people. And I don't, I have not seen those threats materialize. You see some folks, you know, usually individuals, um, armed or not armed, who, who might show up. Um, but fundamentally, the protesters seem to be able to handle those, those circumstances. So I haven't seen... Uh, that's strictly in Portland. I, I, I want to actually credit, um, give, give some rare credit to, uh, I think, the, the DA's office's uh, prosecution of these individuals and the release orders preventing them from protesting in Multnomah County being pretty essential. That said, outside of the, the Multnomah County region, uh, what we've seen in Salem is, again, the same kind of uh, militia activity that we saw here in Portland two years ago, people open carrying, people getting preferential treatment from the local authorities to do that. And it's emboldening people. Uh, it's, it's kind of incredible actually that the last two months have uh, really encompassed a lot of my preoccupations of the last seven years. Prisons, police, and the far right. So I see you on Twitter at all hours of the night monitoring these protests the same way that a lot of us in the in the press are, uh, if we're not out on the streets ourselves, watching this uh, from our laptops and phones. Do you find that you are uh, staying up until the wee hours, and that has changed your schedule, or or, or are you like setting yourself a curfew? <laughs> I I consistently tell myself I am going to bed at ten. I'm not going to you know check the phone, but then things are buzzing and I have to uh, respond to, to some things. Um, yeah, Twitter is a fascinating, <laughs> fascinating tool. Um, I think it's just, how can you not stay up after seeing some of the shit we've, we've, we've seen online? You know, people bloodied, people beaten, people gassed. Um, I, uh, like a lot of Portlanders who have gone out, um, I've experienced a lot of these things firsthand. You know, I think a lot of my best legal observing days are probably behind me. But um, I see these things and it triggers something in me, frankly. I, I, I feel the blood pressure rise. I can taste the, the adrenaline on my tongue. And I, I don't think that's a, something that's talked about enough that um, these weapons that the police are using have long-term impacts on people. And it, it, it's hard not to be a partisan once you've been subjected to them. Um, so definitely, definitely impacted my sleep. I mean, for a while there too, uh, like clockwork around 1130, you'd start hearing the bangs. I only live, you know, three or so miles from downtown. And, and I think a lot of people even as far out as 40 something can hear those explosions and it gets my nerves going. Tell me about it. I'm on the west side. 